want to go ahead and get us kicked off. Uh, we've got a few more people I think are going to be joining us, but we'll go ahead and get started right on time. Okay. like you got stuck. So I guess I'm going to lean on Dean maybe and go ahead. Mayor, I don't know if you're you're stuck or we're stuck, but we are. He, he's stuck. Okay. I think he's uh, leaving it up to you. Okay, well, I will go ahead and, and get us started. Welcome everyone uh, for our TAT chat for November. Uh, it's hard to believe that it is already November and we are uh, heading towards the holidays. Um, as we get started, uh, you can see on the screen our uh, wonderful leadership level funding partners. We wanna, again, thank all of them for their support. And this is uh, uh, only about a quarter of, of all of our funding support Supporters. So I want to thank uh, everyone who is uh, a funding supporter of Tenant through your support that we're able to uh, continue uh, pushing forward on our mission of encouraging collaboration and partnerships on issues that impact economic vitality and quality of life here in our upstate region. So um, with this session today, we are transitioning the TAT chats from uh, when we started them in April of 2020, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we did them weekly. Uh, then we went, uh, I believe in, in the summer or fall last year, we went to every other week. And um, now we are transitioning to once a month. So we'll have one today and then our next one on December 2nd. And then we will start monthly uh, every month uh, in 2022 uh, as well. So um, we are very fortunate today to have kind of our, our uh, uh, um, I know he's our favorite for most everybody speaker, but uh, our, our regular, I would say in Scott Carr, I think uh, Scott, this is either the fourth or fifth time you've been with us uh, since the pandemic started. So, you know, we really appreciate uh, all of your uh, willingness to, uh, continue giving updates to the community. I think it's so important. Um, you know, GSP is such a, a vital part of uh, our community. And, and uh, since the pandemic started, you guys have really had to, to uh, adjust and then readjust and then adjust again. And, uh, um, you know, I think the story of what you guys are doing is a tremendous one. I appreciate your willingness to always come on and, and share with us um, you know, what's happening. And I know you have some very uh, great news with new airlines coming in and, and your cargo and freight and all that. So with that, I will turn it over to you and, and let you share uh, with us an update. And please remember everyone, if you have any questions, uh, to put them on uh, in the chat and we will follow up. Well, thank you, Dean. I, as always, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, provide an update um, to all of the 10 of the top members. And uh, with that, let me see if I can share my screen. Can, can everybody see that okay? Terrific. Well, good afternoon. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to provide you with an update on uh, GSP. A lot of exciting things here uh, happening at the airport. So if you haven't traveled out of GSP recently, um, just wanted to mention a couple of the amenities and different things uh, that have changed over the summer. Uh, so the uh, Manchester Airport Group's uh, escape lounge that's located in the Grand Hall, it reopened in August of 2021. Um, if you, This is an agnostic um, airline lounge, so you don't have to be a member of a, a certain airline uh, membership loyalty program to go in. Uh, if you have the American Express Platinum card, uh, as well as some of the other American Express cards, that will get you in plus two guests for free. 
And this is just like, um, one of those amenities that we heard from the business community that they wanted. So we, uh, we worked hard to get this. We're actually the smallest airport uh, in the US that has an escape lounge. And so um, if you haven't checked it out, I encourage you to do so. If you uh, don't have one of those cards, you can also get in. I believe currently they're charging $35 uh, for entry and it includes food and beverage. So uh, you can see here, there is a bar area uh, located there. And then they have all of a variety of hot and cold foods, uh, both you know breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And those are actually all the menus and all of the food items are done uh, by Rick Irwin's. So they have a partnership with one of their executive chefs. And so um, lots of great uh, foods and uh, different drinks that they have available uh, before you take your next flight out of GS Plea. And then one of the other exciting things that we did is um, we just opened up uh, Qdoba Mexican Eats. It's the first for this concept uh, in upstate South Carolina. So uh, we're excited to introduce this brand to the, to the region. Um, it is a fast casual Mexican restaurant. It's located in the Grand Hall right next to Chick-fil-A. And that opened uh, the third week of August. So if you haven't had a chance to try that out, I uh, encourage you to check them out also. Lots of, uh, lots of good things to eat there. We also just resumed uh, shuttle service to our economy lots. And I put a map of the economy lots there. So currently economy lot one, economy lot three are closed. Um, however, economy lot two is open uh, and we do have shuttle service that just started back on Monday. Uh, so if you're parking out there, um, there will be shuttle bus service for the upcoming holiday season. Uh, so there's different shelters located throughout that parking lot. So I would encourage you to wait for the shuttle. You no longer have to walk up to the terminal building um, if you're utilizing that lot. Also, just real quickly, parking garage A and parking garage B are also open. Um, and we'll open up economy lot one and economy lot three as needed. Economy lot one is a brand new 1500 space lot uh, that we just constructed. Uh, we were running out of parking routinely prior to the pandemic. And so that was a lot that we were doing as an interim step prior to constructing a third parking garage, um, garage C, that would be located right next to B. Um, that project's currently on hold um, and as the passenger traffic continues to recover, but, uh, but we'll open those up as demand warrants. And then for valet parking, uh, we're still evaluating uh, business travelers uh, coming back and returning. Um, but uh, we anticipate that that may be sometime uh, first quarter or second quarter of uh, 2022 that we'll start valet parking again. Some folks are still a little um, uh, hinky about folks getting into their cars and touching it, uh, folks that aren't um, you know, part of their family. So uh, that's something that we're taking a look at. We just wanna make sure that we have enough um, folks that are interested in valet parking before we actually bring that back. And then next, um, just wanted to reiterate, uh, since we, we, we brought this up a couple of times, but uh, GSP, we were honored um, to be named the best airport in North America by ACI, which is Airports Council International, uh, for the two to five million passenger category. Um, and this award is very special to us because it's nothing that we do to nominate ourselves or to do anything of that nature. This is actually based on intercept surveys with our passengers. And so... Um, folks actually uh, will walk up to random passengers and have give them a tablet and ask them to uh, fill out a survey based on their experience at the airport. So we're very excited about this. Um, and we're, we're hoping that uh, we'll be honored to, to be the best airport in North America again in 2021. So we're in the final quarter and um, we hope that we'll get uh, good results from the traveling public and be able to uh, to share with you in sometime March, April timeframe that we were named this again for another year. But thanks to all of our passengers for um, the good survey results and supporting their hometown airport. We really appreciate it. We also um, were just uh, accredited through the Airports Council International Airport Health Accreditation Program. Uh, we are the first airport in South Carolina to achieve this accreditation. And this is just based on all the things that we're doing to make sure that we keep our tenants and our employees, and most importantly, the traveling public safe, just through our uh, rigorous um, cleaning standards and programs that we have in place um, with all of our janitorial staff. Uh, so we were, uh, we were honored to get this, and I just wanted to communicate that. 
Uh, we're doing everything we can to make sure that folks um, have a safe travel experience uh, when they're flying uh, during the pandemic. This is actually a first look. We haven't even put a press release out about this yet, um, but I did want to put this in here. So if you are traveling um, and you go down to visit the uh, escape lounge before your flight, you'll see this off to the right hand side. We had a little alcove area and we're trying to figure out what to do with that. And so we turn it into an airport history museum. And I, I got to give a shout out to Tom Tyra, and uh, who's on this call, as well as the rest of his team. We did all this in-house uh, with their team and very talented folks um, that put this all together, did all the research, and was able to go out and find pictures and uh, with the various historical societies, uh, newspaper articles, those types of things to put this together. But uh, I think it turned out very well. Um, really gives you the past, present, and future of GSP. A um, couple other looks at it here. So you can, you can see there, we start over here on the left-hand side with uh, the Flatwood community, because the airport used to be located um, on the site of a community called Flatwood, South Carolina. And we had the Flatwood Peaches baseball team. And you can just see there, then we go by decade, you know, uh, with the, the various history um, of the airport. And then also did some before and after photos of you know how things look back in 1962 and how do they look today. So it's kind of interesting, um, and uh, or we certainly find it interesting. We hope that folks will too, and I uh, encourage you to stop by on your next trip from GSP. One of the other things uh, that we're doing is we started a Carolina Traveler podcast. So this is available on Apple as well as on Spotify. Uh, so if you listen to podcasts, um, certainly encourage you to download this. Um, we're uploading um, about approximately every week we have a, um, a new podcast that we're putting out there. So uh, we try to provide information not only on the airport, but things also going on in the community that um, relate to the airport too, or things to do uh, throughout the local community. So uh, if you haven't checked this out, certainly encourage you to do so. Then I wanted to talk a little bit of just about airport passenger traffic. So how are we doing? How are we recovering uh, from the pandemic? And so today uh, we have 21 nonstop cities and a week and a half, we're gonna have 22 with the addition of Nashville service on Contour Airlines. And I'll talk a little bit about that in just a second, but we're served by seven airlines today, Allegiant, American, uh, Delta, Silver, Southwest, and United, and as I mentioned, um, soon to be Contour to make the total of seven. And with those 22 sit nonstop cities that we're, we have service to, that's actually the most um, nonstop routes that we've had since the airport opened on October 15th of 1962. Uh, so we're just continuing to grow. We want to make sure that we're a catalyst for the community, for economic development, and that we're you know keeping pace with the needs of the community and getting people uh, to the places that mean the most to them and where they need to go uh, when they need to get there, whether it's business or for leisure or travel. And then just looking at um, airline market share, currently American is our largest airline. Uh, prior to the pandemic, that was Delta, and this is based on number of seats. Uh, so American uh, was number two previously, but uh, through the pandemic, um, Delta pulled back a little bit of service. That is coming back. Um, but American is currently 35%, Delta at 30, um, Southwest and United are tied at 15. And then we have Allegiant and Silver Airways um, making up the bottom 5% of service. Um, and I do just want to mention for Silver Airways, that is a new airline. So we have added uh, two new airlines during the pandemic, being Silver and Contour. And Silver started service back in March, and they're flying nonstop down to Orlando, Tampa, and Jacksonville. So if you're going down to the Sunshine State, and are looking for a nonstop flight, would encourage you to go to silverairways.com and check them out um, and see if the, their schedule works for you. It's a, it's, we've actually flown on them to Jacksonville and down to Orlando, and um, I have had both great flights with them. And then talk a little bit about Contour Airlines. So that new nonstop service to Nashville, Music City, USA, that starts on November 17th, um, which is a little less than two weeks. Uh, and so we're really excited about this. This will be five uh, weekly flights. So they'll be operating every day, but Tuesdays and Saturdays. And if the service um, is well received by the community, uh, we can see that going to daily. And then they've also talked about possibly double daily. So a morning and an afternoon flight. So um, 
encourage you to check out Contour Airlines. Um, one of the great things about them is there's only 30 seats on the aircraft. Uh, they took a 50 seat regional jet and uh, put 30 seats on it. So every seat is first class, um, but they don't have first class prices. Uh, so you can do a round trip for under $200 on them. So uh, again, encourage you to check out Contour um, Airlines and uh, if you have a need to go to Nashville. And just a little bit about passenger traffic. So um, as you can see here, you know, things were continuing to grow. We had done, uh, had 2.61 million passengers in 2019, and then the pandemic hit in 2020. Um, so we were setting a, um, a record for the airport in 2019. We had 27 consecutive months of increased passenger traffic. Um, and then the airport had also experienced six years of record banking growth. So we thought 2020 was gonna be a wonderful year for us uh, and break that 2.61 million uh, passenger record. Um, and we were on track to do that in the first two months of the year. And you can see that here. Uh, the blue is calendar year 19, orange is 2020, and um, green is 2021. And you can see January, February, uh, you know, we were up 5.9% over the previous year. Um, February, we were up 8.7%. And then you can see in March when the bottom fell out with the pandemic, uh, things had gotten really bad there. If you take a look at April uh, for 2020 in the orange, we were down 96%. We only had 4% of the traffic in April of 2020 that we had, uh, had seen in April of 2019. But if you look at the green, you can see we're recovering nicely. Um, so we're about 80%, uh, 78% uh, of the traffic that we had um, for September of uh of 2019 so things are continuing to recover uh july was a great month for us and then school started so things on the leisure sides uh paired back a little bit but only about two percentage points uh so we're continuing um to stay on track with what we had budgeted for for the year so we're doing really well um for where we had forecasted it would be at this time um when we had done the budget about six to nine months ago so uh things are are continuing to recover. Uh, we expect that recovery to continue into 2022, and we expect to be fully recovered by 2024. Just real quick, I um, wanted to give you an update on the FBO and our cargo operations. Uh, so we do have a 110,000 square foot air cargo facility here at GSP. We opened that up in September of 2019. It has um, three 747 uh, parking positions. Uh, so we can have three of uh, those aircraft on the apron simultaneously, and that apron's uh, 17 acres in size. This is just another view of it uh, from the land side. Um, and but if you look on the if you look on the left hand side of that of the screen there, you'll see there's a wall there. We're actually going to be knocking that wall out. We're in design right now um, to add an additional 50,000 square feet to make this 160,000 square foot facility. We're just busting at the seams currently for air cargo. And we're not only seeing cargo that's, you know, here for the upstate and the Western Carolinas region, but we're really uh, starting to become uh, a gateway airport for cargo uh, for the entire Southeast U.S. We have folks that are flying things in um, that are going down to Florida, all the way out to Texas, and even up into the Midwest and the Northeast. Um, People find out, you know, they fly in, they clear customs within 30, 45 minutes, and their cargo's being offloaded on the plane, and we can turn the plane around typically in three, three and a half hours. They don't enjoy that um, that same type of convenience when they go through Miami or Chicago or JFK. Uh, so we're starting to become a well-known alternative to some of those typical gateway airports for air cargo uh, around the U.S. So um, as that demand continues, we've got to be able to make sure that we keep pace with that. And so that's one of the things that we're doing by adding that additional 50,000 square feet and some additional apron space. The great thing is, is when we laid this uh, out approximately three or four years ago, um, we were able to take this building and actually mirror it on the other side. So if you take a look in the back there behind that 747, you can actually see some dirt out there. Um, we can take this facility, mirror it onto the other side to have uh, 320,000 square feet of uh, air cargo space as needed. And then we can take that 320 and we can flip it again uh, to get us up to you know, over half a million square feet um, that in the future if, if demand warrants at some point to do that. And then this is just showing some of that demand that we've had. So we, you know, we have a lot of folks that are flying in. You can see British Airways there, uh, Magma, TUI, 
uh, Moss Air out of Mexico. Um, and so we just having daily flights and, you know, typically these are um, all, they're, they're called um, freighter flights, you know, because it's all air cargo, but there is a new term uh, that's been coined called praters. And that's when airlines fly a passenger airline, but use it as a freighter, they'll call it a praetor. And so that's what you're seeing there with TUI and um, British Airways. So some of these airlines, since they weren't flying folks internationally, since there wasn't a lot of folks uh, traveling uh, back and forth between the US and Europe, they wanted to make sure that they're still making payments on these airplanes. So they had to get a little creative and figure out how they could keep them in revenue service. So one of the things they started doing is just putting cargo on them. Uh, no passengers, um, but it still has a flight crew on it, uh, but it's just full of cargo. And so uh, that's worked out really well uh, for folks. And that's also, you know, worked out well for us and just allowing us to show our, cap show our capabilities without, um, with, with folks that typically wouldn't fly here or have the opportunity like British Airways as an example. So um, that's uh, been a blessing for us throughout the pandemic. Our cargo business has been up significantly. And you can see that here is through over the last decade through 2020. In 2020, we had done a little over 65,000 tons of cargo uh, here at the airport. But just taking a look at, you know, um, the last three years, you can see what we did in 2019 there in the blue, uh, yellow, I'm sorry, the orange being 2020, but you can see our, our traffic or the amount of cargo that we're actually handling here in 2021 in the green is just up significantly. So um, we don't see an end, end, end in sight for that. Um, we expect that to continue well into 2022, 2023. Uh, that's why we're making the additional investment in expanding those air cargo facilities so that we can continue to try to keep pace with demand. And then this is just some of our um, some of our top trading companies, and in, and also the amount of international trade handled through GSP. That was over uh, three point seven billion dollars in uh, twenty twenty, and then also for that calendar year, um, GSP was ranked number twenty by total weight for all of the freight that came through, as well as number twenty two in the country by total value. So. Uh, we've moved up on the list. Historically, we've been in the 80s and 90s um, for, you know, top airports that are handling cargo. Um, but, you know, we're in the we're in the low 20s now. There are, you know, that's on a calendar year basis. If we look at certain months, certain months, you know, we've been 17, 18 uh, ranked in the U.S. based by total weight and total value. So, um we're really starting to, to get some traction on the cargo side. And then you can see the, the top trading companies there being Germany, Mexico, Malaysia, Hungary, Canada, and the top five. Um, so the, the fairly diverse um, countries that are sending things in and out, uh, imports and export, exports out of GSP. Um, so that's exciting to see also. Then just want to talk very briefly about our master plans and some of the future aviation development uh, that we have planned here for, at the airport. So this is our master plan. It was approved by the Federal Aviation Administration in February of 2020. And you can see the current runway there uh, on up here at the top. And then everything that you see in yellow, or those are current buildings that exist today at the airport, but everything that's in that blue aqua color are all future planned buildings um, here at the airport. And if you look on the right hand side, since we were just talking about cargo, you can actually see over here um, where some of the, uh, the cargo activity is. It, you can see the current building, but then you can see the apron and the additional buildings uh, that we plan to build out. So we have lots of room for expansion on the air cargo front in the future. And then at the, toward the bottom of the drawing, you can see the future runway too. So this is a 7,000 foot runway that we have on our master plan. It gives us the capability to provide some redundancy in the event um, that the other runway wouldn't be available, whether that be for construction or any other reason. Um, so it just gives us that, that operational redundancy that uh, that we like to have. But that, that runway is a little bit down the road. Uh, typically, you don't start planning for a runway until you uh, meet about 60% of your annual service volume. Uh, that's when the FAA will allow you to uh, start to start applying a grant funding toward the design of a runway. Uh, currently, our 11,000 foot runway uh, today, we're probably about 23, 24, 25% of the annual service volume. So we have lots of runway capacity here at the airport. 
that we can fill up before we would actually need that second runway, other than for the purpose of having redundancy. Um, and there could be a, a reason to do that. You know, if a FedEx hub um, was going to come here for some reason or UPS or some other type of freight forwarder that says well, we have to have two runways just for redundancy purposes, that could be something that triggers it and um, where we say that, okay, we need to move this project forward now. But typically just from an an annual service volume standpoint, we still have, you know, a lot of capacity available to us uh, to continue to grow here at the airport from a, a operations perspective uh, for takeoffs and landings. And then just some of the other capital projects over the next five years. So these total a little over $300 million and we've completed some of these and others are in various phases of development. Uh, the first one there, uh, aircraft rescue firefighting facility that opened up in February, I'm sorry, that opened up in November of uh, 2020. Uh, that was an $8 million project. As I mentioned, the parking garage, uh, that's a project we've completed all the design on it. We just tapped the brakes on it for, for construction. It's an $80 million project. Um, and so that's something that uh, we'll take a look at doing in the future as demand warrants. Uh, the air cargo apron and cargo boating phase two, that's the project I was just talking about. Uh, so that's the additional 50,000 square foot uh, facility as well as uh, expansion of the current uh, 17 acre apron. And we also have an FBO expansion. That's where corporate aircraft, general aviation aircraft are coming through. We operate that under the name of Ceridian Aviation, which is owned and operated by the airport. So it's airport staff. We just have a different name for it. Uh, then we also have a facilities building expansion. Um, we just completed that surface parking expansion. That was that uh, new economy lot, economy lot one that has that 1500 spaces of parking. So that's been completed. We're excited about that. Um, so that way, if um, as we continue to get busier, as passengers return to the air uh, for business travel, as well as for leisure, uh, we'll, we're already set up and ready to go and have enough uh, parking available for the traveling public. We also have some um, runway and taxiway rehabilitation projects, $25 million. Those are underway currently. So if you've flown in and out of the airport recently, you'll see certain sections of the taxiway uh, that parallels that 11,000 foot runway that are closed. Um, and so those are currently all being resurfaced. And then we have uh, a terminal expansion project, and it's a $190 million project, um, and that's to expand Concourse B. I'm going to talk about that in more detail here in just a second. Um, and then we also uh, just acquired uh, two new 1,500-gallon aircraft rescue firefighting trucks, uh, and we also have a fuel farm expansion underway. So that expansion was underway uh, prior to um, the Colonial uh, Pipeline shutdown. Uh, so we were actually working on the design of that just based on the number of cargo aircraft that are flying in and out of the airport. They require a lot of fuel. And so um, we need to have a larger fuel farm. Currently today we have uh, 150,000 gallon fuel farm and we're going to expand that up to a uh, 250,000 uh, gallon fuel farm. And so we'll have an extra 100,000 a, a gallon of capacity. That'll give us approximately three days of fuel on hand, um, which is kind of a sweet spot uh, for airports to be in just in case there is any supply chain disruptions. Um, when, we, when we had that right now um, we, during the Colonial Pipeline, uh, shut down. We didn't have any issues here at the airport. Uh, we were able to continue to get fuel, uh, but we were receiving it at a uh, lesser pace than we typically do. So instead of getting, you know, 18 truckloads, we were getting 13 truckloads as an example. Uh, we were still able to, to continue to operate, uh, but having a little extra cushion with that extra 100,000 gallons will certainly go a long way in the future, just in the event uh, something like that happens again, as well as just allowing us to ex and continue to um, expand our capabilities uh, to provide, again, uh, more air service, both on the passenger and air cargo side. This is the that garage C. So I just wanted to show this. It, um, we're going to move our rental car facility over there. It's currently in garage A, but uh, prior to the pandemic, we were, uh, we were really outpacing um, the uh, the facilities they were constrained uh, based on the number of folks that were traveling in and out of GSP. So we recognized very quickly that we needed to have uh, more spacious facilities to handle the influx of passengers as we were getting over that 2.6 million folks in uh, in 2019. So we designed this, and we also recognized that we needed additional public parking. So it's a 1,500 space garage. 
uh, 750 spaces for public parking, 750 spaces dedicated to rental car facilities. The nice thing about this is the way we've designed it is there's a helix on the right hand side there. Uh, we can actually uh, take public parking and convert that into rental car spaces as needed. So at some point in the future, this may become a dedicated rental car facility um, once it's constructed. But uh, as of right now, this project is on hold and we'll continue to evaluate the market and see when the right time it is to start the project. It's approximately a 24 month project. So we have to forecast out in the future uh, to figure out when's the best time to start it because uh, we don't want to be behind the curve, um, but also we don't want to uh, build it prematurely um, if demand doesn't warrant doing so. And in the airport hotel, you may have seen um, some articles uh, about this project. So we originally went out last February, I put an RFP out on the street uh, for a hotel facility. And the intention at that time was we were looking for a ground, someone to come and build and operate a hotel at GSP. And uh, we were looking to do it as a ground lease. And one of the proposals or the proposal that we actually received um, include, included a ground lease, but it was also asking for the airport to make a, uh, an investment in the facility to and effectively be a joint venture partner with them with the hotel developer. And so uh, that was a little bit different than what we had contemplated. And one of the other things that they had uh, put in their proposal was that they wanted to make sure that a market and feasibility study uh, was completed and came back with favorable results. So we went ahead and completed that marketing feasibility study for the project. Um, Cause initially we anticipated that uh, proposers would wanna do that themselves, um, but in this case they didn't. So we went ahead and did that. But the, uh, what came back out of that marketing feasibility study was that the airport should own and operate the, uh, the hotel facility, just like we're uh, doing with Cerulean Aviation and handling all the cargo and the fueling here at the airport and make that another line of business. Well, that was completely different uh, from what we had originally envisioned with just doing a, a simple ground lease. And so uh, at that time, we rejected the proposal that we had in hand. And we're currently evaluating next steps. So we'll be going back to the airport commission as staff uh, here in a workshop in the, in the near future and coming back with some additional recommendations um, of what next steps may look like and make sure that uh, staff and the airport commission are aligned uh, to move this project forward or, or to not move forward. Um, ultimately, that's up to the commission. So um, Stay tuned, the, uh, more to come on this project. Uh, we think it'll be a great asset if, we, if the airport commission decides to move forward with it. Um, you can see, this is just a, a rendering that we had put together. And you can see on top there, we actually have a rooftop pool and a rooftop bar hotel uh, on top of the hotel facility would overlook the airfield. We think that'd be a, a kind of a cool, unique um, attribute of the, of the hotel. Um, in addition, just you know, providing the traveling public with a place to stay. Uh, if you have an early morning flight or you get in super late and you need a place to stay, uh, it's, you know, conveniently located, literally um, will be con uh, connected to the, the terminal building and you can walk right out and in, into the hotel. So you're not having to drive anywhere or get on a shuttle bus or do anything of that nature. And this slide just shows where that'll be located. So it'd be on the concourse B side. It's actually where our valet parking uh, currently operates or did operate prior to the pandemic before we suspended valet service. Um, it's on the, the same lot that those cars are parked in. So uh, if you're familiar with our valet service, that's gonna be the site of the future hotel uh, should that move forward. And then uh, this is probably the most exciting part of the presentation as I wrap up. This is the terminal expansion program. And so this would be an expansion of concourse B. It would add two wide body gates and eight narrow body gates. Uh, today we have uh, 13 gates at the airport. So this would actually take us up to 23 gates. In addition, it would replace our current uh, FIS Federal Inspection Service and Customs Border Protection Facility that we have on Concourse A. And it would uh, build a new facility that meets all the current standards for CBP um, on Concourse B. So it'd have that dedicated international arrivals area it's approximately 133, 134,000 square foot addition. Um, and it would allow us to also have a seamless transition in the future over to Terminal 2. So Concourse A and B today are what we're gonna call Terminal 1. But then we also have in, in our master plan, a, a, a second terminal 
um, that would be uh, right next to concourse B. And so that's something, you know, that's, that's a little ways down the road. However, this project prior to the pandemic, we were getting ready to, um, we had done some preliminary design layouts for it, as you can see, and we're getting ready to move it forward. Uh, so you can probably anticipate this project uh, kicking off sometime um, in various phases. There's uh, actually five different phases for it. Um, and you can see those there totaling $190,000, uh, or I'm sorry, $190, $190 million. Um, and so you can see uh, those, those different phases and you can see how we would build that out on the end of uh, uh, of concourse B. And these are these phases are uh, we've tied these to uh, passenger uh, traffic levels. So we actually have, uh, you know, when we get to a certain level of employments, number of folks that are flying in and out of the airport, um, at that point, that's when we need to do the enabling project. And then when we reach another passenger threshold, that's when we would kick in and do phase one and et cetera, all the way through to phase five. And so um, that way we don't get uh, caught behind the power curve of, you know, trying to play catch up to make sure that we're providing the facilities that we need to, to serve the community as the hometown airport. And with that, I just wanted to do, um, sorry, my phone was ringing. Just with that, I wanted to do a, uh, a quick um, animation. And so this is just bringing us in here and you can see um, that's that 1500 space slot there and the economy lot, you can see uh, we have the parking garage B and that one that has the two helixes, that's uh, parking garage C. So we're gonna come down here on the GSP drive. And you can see uh, the new parking garage with those rental car facilities. Those are located on the left-hand side there um, where that parking garage is located. We're gonna come up here to a new traffic circle uh, that'll be constructed in the future. And that will take us up toward that new terminal two um, that we anticipate, you know, again, that's probably 15, 20, 25 years out, but there'll be a terminal two um, that'll be on the right-hand side. And this will be the new um, entrance road uh, coming in uh, to the current terminal facility that we have today. So you can see terminal two will be on the right. You got parking garage C on the left. We're gonna come up here and we'll see um, the expanded area of uh, Concourse B. And then there's the Landside Hotel. We, we weren't real original in coming up with that name. We could have came up with something else, um, but it will be a branded facility. It will be at some, you know, a Hilton Marriott or Hyatt or something of that nature uh, of a brand uh, or within their brand families. This is the current um, facilities that we have today. Parking Garage B on the left, the current terminal facilities on the right. And then one of the other things that we're doing here um, is we've recognized the need for off airport shuttles um, and you know, buses. Uh, so we wanna make sure that since we only have a single level terminal building, it's not a dual level facility uh, where you have departures you know, on the upper level and arrivals on the bottom, um, is that we provide enough uh, a throughput capacity for vehicle access and make sure it's not congested. So we're actually splitting out those buses into a different, uh, a different lane. And you can see that a little bit there um, as we pan out. And then over here is Concourse A. And so we do have a small extension that's shown on Concourse A on the end here. That's currently not planned, but it is shown here as, a, as an option. And then coming down on Concourse A, um, you can see the, uh, the nine gates that they're, that's located there today. And then you can see the airside garden uh, in be located between Concourse A and Concourse B. And today, Concourse B has four gates, uh, B1, B2, B3, and B4. So you can see those, those first four gates located there. And then you can see the additional gates that we're going to construct beyond that. You can see the hotel facility behind uh, with the pool area. And... And then you can see those additional gates that would be constructed. And then just to give you a quick idea of what it would look like on the inside. So this is an expansion of Concourse B again. And it will have the same finishes that we have that we did through the $127 million wingspan project. So things will look just the same as they do today. We'll continue those finishes throughout the expanded area. Um, but you can see we have a lot of additional seating. Uh, we have uh, additional restroom facilities, restaurants, uh, stores, uh, retail stores, 
We created um, in here a, a nice atrium area, which we'll see here in just a second, uh, with a large fountain in, in the center. And so uh, this is, you know, hypothetically how it could end up looking. Um, and once we get into design, uh, we'll, you know, finalize that and see exactly how it'll look. And then you can see the additional hold room and uh, areas for the additional gates that will be located out there. And with that, I appreciate everybody's time and be happy to answer any questions. So Scott, thank you. And uh, Erica has put your article from uh, earlier today on our, from the newsletter up uh, in the link for anyone who is interested. And then we had a question from uh, Michael Brown. Uh, there are no plans to rename the expanding airport, like, I don't know, Upstate International or anything of that nature. I mean, I would assume right now you're probably pretty steady with GSP. Correct. Yeah, I, uh, there's been no discussions of uh, changing the airport name. It will, um, as of right now, the, no discussions of changing that to anything different than what it is today. Okay, so uh, we don't have a, a whole lot more time. You were so thorough, which is is greatly appreciated. Uh, but I did have one uh, uh, have one uh, one question about kind of. It seems like you guys are are at about you said eighty percent of capacity compared to pre. How does that compare to other airports? Uh, of similar size or even larger airports? Yeah, I think we're doing extremely well uh, based on the national average. Um, so the national average, we're right, we're right where we need to be at that 80%. Uh, when you start to look at other small hub airports around the country, you know, because the national average has all the airports um, uh, averaged together. But when you look at other small hub airports, um, we were just at, I just came back from Baton Rouge um, earlier today uh, based on some airline meetings. And we know that there's uh, gonna be some announcements tomorrow uh, for airports that are actually losing their service on certain airlines. I'm not gonna name the, the, the airports or the airline uh, that's doing that, but uh, there's an airline that's gonna be cutting uh, eight airports that are smaller out of their system. Um, and those are airports that uh, for whatever reason, the, 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 the passengers haven't returned. Uh, you know, we're, we've been blessed uh, that folks have returned to flying here at GSP. Um, and so, but, you know, not everybody has been as, uh, as fortunate or as blessed as we have been. Absolutely. I think we can say that about a number of things, the airport being just one. And I think part of it, as we've said before, is the, the great leadership uh, from your commission down to Dave Edwards and yourself and your team. You guys have really been proactive and and I think the I mean the, the stats just about the cargo the increase in the cargo over the last three to five years is tremendous and then looking at the your your um, you know mock-up of what it may look like or could look like in another 10 20 years is just absolutely amazing so congratulations Scott on all you guys do and thank you for for your work and and thank you again for your support Tenant top I would be remiss not to say, uh, especially thank you for allowing us to have our first uh, blues, brews, and barbecue on um, your uh, parking lot a couple months ago. It was a great event, and we're hopeful to be able to continue that in the future, and I really appreciate, you know, when we started, as you know, we started talking about having that event. I said, we just want to have it in a big open place, and, and uh, actually, Murray Dorn, was the one who said, well, what about GSP? And, and you guys were great partners on that. So thank you for allowing Absolutely. us to host that event. Absolutely. We appreciate the opportunity to do it. Well, we look forward to going to Nashville and to see what other great destinations you have planned in the coming weeks. I know I, having served on the Air Service Committee, you guys are always out there scouting uh, new places to uh, have for us to go. So I have no doubt we'll be traveling uh, to, to even better uh, or additional uh, locations here soon. So again, Scott, thank you to you and Tom and to Dave and all of your team. Absolutely, thank you so much, appreciate it. All right, and we will have Scott again sometime next spring, I have no doubt uh, again, and, and things will continue to be going. So uh, we're gonna pivot now uh, to our resource update. And before we do that real quick, um, Erica will put into the chat um, and a link to the 10th to top events 
page so you can see what we have coming up uh, in the coming weeks, uh, a number of workshops around uh, our Safer Upstate initiative, around uh, the entrepreneurial ecosystem with a Global Entrepreneur Week next week. We have an in-person event. We'd love for you all to attend. And then our Celebrating Successes event on November 17th. Uh, we're, we're getting great uh, response for that event. So we, we're very excited about that. So those events are coming up. Um, so we'll start with our first update. I'm thrilled to, uh, to welcome uh, Michael Brown with Sustaining Way, uh, who is with us. And um, Erica will put the article from Sustaining Way that was in our newsletter uh, today. But, but Michael, uh, thank you for, for being with us and uh, look forward to hearing a little bit of an update of what, what you've been doing. Thank you, thank you. It's, uh, it's an easy act to follow. Uh, when you hear from Scott, <laughs> no, actually not. But I, I definitely appreciate uh, this opportunity. As as a many of you know, a long-standing member of County Council for a number of years, it is very, very, very rewarding with the work that I'm engaged in now with Sustaining Way. And if I could, I just want to share just a little bit with you. Uh, if I can share my screen, do so. Well, yep. the question is, what it. is sustaining? You have? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Sustaining Way is a community-based nonprofit. And every day, day in and day out, we use education and collaboration to advocate for sustainable and caring and, and indeed equitable communities. Um, and we're focused on what's going on currently in our present environment and, and, and clearly with a focus on the future. But in order to accomplish that mission, Sustaining Way began uh, literally 10 years ago as we've just celebrated um, that decade long time period. It engages in our uh, demonstration opportunities that happen within the communities that we operate. And for that, with our model of proliferation, we seek to come into a community uh, based upon invitation, uh, locate, uh, property that we can bolster, make energy efficient, and utilize as a living, learning, and of course, an expanding education opportunity. And we do that now uh, in the Nickel Town uh, community as our first site with a location known as Annie's House, which is located on 60 Baxter Street. And as I said, we look at it under the auspices of sustainability. And we, and we've, we encompass that in three major areas. Affordability being at the base of it, but caring for people and caring for the environment are fundamental to what we do. We're not an environmental organization per se, but clearly uh, as this mission began from Rick Joy, and I know some of you may know Rick uh, and his day-to-day -day capacity as the interna international supply chain manager for the Michelin Corporation for North America and South America. It's based out of his work with Creation Care as a deacon at the local church of First Baptist Greenville that he had this concept, this vision in terms of how could he take on an opportunity with others to better work and change his environment. And Sustaining Way grew out of that. And the notions of sustainability uh, have burgeoned from that. Six areas of sustainability that we engage in uh, with our work is food and landscape, energy and energy efficiency, uh, consumption and waste, healthy lifestyles, environmental sustainability and social sustainability. Now, when we talk about food and landscape, clearly uh, we are engaging our communities to change the, the current reality of how the communities, unfortunately, are found uh, most of the time to be food deserts, uh, devoid of any type of consistent nutritional opportunities, having to rely on the primary basis of nutrition coming from a local corner store, a dollar store, or some other supplemental activity. Uh, because uh, most of these communities are devoid of any type of uh, grocery store or, or any type of uh, restaurant chain that would be beneficial for even uh, fresh, hot cooked meals. And so we do work on that each and every day. And our second primary focus, uh, as we, we are very focused, is energy and energy efficiency. And we do that uh, with some of the work that we've done uh, in, the, in the Nickel Town community to make the homes much more energy efficient as we have an ongoing opportunity to engage in fitting those homes. 
Nickel Town, very indemnity of any other community that we find ourselves in terms of uh, low income minority communities with the, the, the most um, negative aspects of any of the indices we can look at, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and high levels of stroke. 38% medium income of Greenville County. It's a food desert. High rates of preventable diseases that we engage in in, in terms of combating every day. And of course, 37% of the neighborhood homes and buildings are substandard or basically falling in disarray. And of course, there are negative impacts of what some would deem as community redevelopment, but clearly, you know, the, the contemporary terms with that. And a number of youth, we know if youth have limited opportunities, they have greater opportunities to do other things. And so we work on that each and every day. And so our approach, we're very focused on asset-based asset uh, community development and building community resiliency with our sustainable practices. Uh, being a community-based, uh, we engage in programming and capacity building, which uh, in the 10 years now, we find ourselves uh, burgeoning to one of the other five traditional African-American communities in Greenville with the, uh, the New Washington Heights community. And our demonstration sites, as, as I said, are strategically located in underserved communities. And we have on-site coordinators. And I'll explain that uh, very briefly. And we've had now well over 60 local, regional, and national partner organizations. We wouldn't be able to operate with our staff of, of six if we did not have the expanded opportunities. And of course, our flagship project, Annie's House, uh, implements our, our model in the historic Nickel Town community in Greenville. And so empowering people with our sustainable practices, uh, if you teeter from the, from the left to the right, our, our apprenticeship programs, which we take community members, teach them skills that uh, not only can help upfit or engage in remodeling and making homes very energy efficient. Uh, clearly, we have an ongoing steward program with, with our youth, uh, but the overall uh, ability to do the things that we're doing with the community co comes from our coordinator program in which we engage young people that uh, traditionally have been college graduates that come with a lot of skill, but they have an opportunity to develop those kind of things. And so that's uh, fundamental to what we do in terms of engaging uh, that development uh, opportunity from our coordinators. Steward leaders, stewards education, of course, our steward fellows. This is a year round opportunity in, in a, a, a three leveled or three tiered uh, way. But this is what we do in terms of just giving back to the community and, and having that multi layered uh, opportunity of engaging our youth and strengthening our bonds within the community. And of course, as I said, 60 Baxter Street is where it happens at Annie's house. And for our efforts, uh, we've been very focused and very fortunate to be recognized and just sharing some of the recent things that we've, we've done. And uh, as the Secretary of State has recognized us in recent times as being one of those charitable organizations that really takes the, the crux of what we get in and we put it directly back out into our, our programming. And this past year, obviously, we've been uh, recognized by Upstate Forever for their Environmental Justice and Equity Award. And so we, we're so very thankful for that. And to, to give you a visual of where we're at, you were out looking out the back door, literally of the back area of First Baptist Greenville, you would see this, this bright yellow house with solar panels uh, that makes us energy efficient to the point of where we're, we're net zero in terms of what we produce. Uh, we don't have to spend additional uh, for the home, uh, for the site that has this wonderful, beautiful garden in the back that is a demonstration uh, garden, but it also uh, leads to an opportunity for expansion of uh, healthy practices and things that come from that. So we're just off the Swamp Reverage Road. And with that, we hope to impact the people that have a chance to, to pass by uh, on an annual basis so they can talk about what's going on with this uh, compound that people have been very curious, very, very curious about. But the word uh, continues to spread in terms of what we're doing uh, on site. And so uh, being mindful of time, that's uh, just the overview of what we do at Sustaining Way. Awesome. Well, thank you, Michael. And, and uh, uh, folks, the website was there if they want to get more. And certainly if you want to put your contact information in the chat, if anyone has any uh, direct questions or wants to reach out to you directly, a great overview and, and a great, uh, uh, a lot of work there. And I must say, I love the logo. Uh, it is with the hands that look like a you know, the bottom of a tree, that is probably as nice a logo as I've seen. So, uh, you know, thank you for all that, that you all are, are doing. Thank you. Thank you. And the Sparberg, we look, look forward to the next location.
Absolutely. And speaking of Spartanburg, uh, our next uh, research, resource uh, speaker is uh, Steve Mims. Uh, and uh, I've known Steve for, for quite a long time, uh, and as I've known Michael uh, since I first got here in the upstate. And Steve, um, we had a great meeting a couple of weeks ago to talk about uh, the work that, that you're doing with veterans. If you'll uh, share a little bit, and Erica will also uh, put the article in the chat uh, about the work you're doing. Steve, welcome. All right, well, thank you, Dean, for, for this opportunity. And, um, you know, Mr. Brown talked about a, a tough act to follow. I really have a tough act to follow with him. I mean, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll leave that alone, Mr. Brown. Great to see you, sir. Um, Austin Wilkes Society, um, you know, um, headquartered out of Columbia. You know, we have a, a pretty large footprint. Uh, basically, you know, youth homes, residential reentry facilities. Um, we have two transitional houses where the veterans transition from homelessness into our transitional houses. One is in Columbia, one is in Greenville. So I spend my time between the, the, the uh, residential house in Greenville and trying to connect the veterans to affordable housing. So that's pretty much as a case manager, my job is now to help those veterans not only find housing, but to sustain their housing. The um, aftercare grant that I, I'm, I'm employed by, um, pretty much, I guess the VA recognized that in order for them to sustain their housing, there need to be some ongoing support. So what I do uh, once an individual leaves the transitional home, I work with them for the next six months to help them sustain their housing, whether it be through employment, um, staying connected through their VA services and just really making sure that our guys don't get kind of out there and get isolated. So I really have a, a very a unique position and a very unique opportunity, you know, to, to be able to work with the, with the veterans. And I, I've learned a tremendous amount over the past few years about that homeless population. You know, we've all encountered, you know, homelessness, whether it be, you know, the person on the side of the street there, but just to, to really get involved and to understand, you know, there's a the many layers to that story, you know, so we, we do a great job at Austin Wilkes trying to help them, you know, we help with deposits and first month ran and we putting guys up in hotels because, you know, with the pandemic, you know, we really see that, uh, you know, those that were kind of on the edge, I'm, I, I think the pandemic really just pushed a lot of people over. So it is the, the need is tremendous out there. And so, Dean, I really, really appreciate this opportunity to speak to such a, a vast audience. And hopefully that, you know, you, you guys can, I know you have your, your core areas and your, your focus areas, but, you know, this is something that we can all get around. You know, I was trying to prepare for it. Like I would say, I got this audience. So how do I tap into this? this wealth, you know, and it's something that it's going to take every one of us doing our little part to put it all together. You know, there's no one magic pill. If it was, we'd be done. But, you know, there's initiatives to end homelessness, but it's such a vicious cycle. And it's such a thing that needs so much energy, so many resources. Um, you know, I'm really like said, trying to find affordable housing in Greenville is like, you know, pulling alligator teeth, you know, it's out there. But you really got to deal with a lot to get to it. So anyone have any, any um, affordable housing ideas or some housing, um, you know, resources that they're willing to share? You know, like I said, I'll put my information in the chat here and love the opportunity to, to work with you to help these guys, you know, find housing and, and more importantly, sustain their housing. So I, you know, kind of went through it real fast because I didn't have any fancy um, uh, PowerPoint or I could probably put something together that flies and flips if you want it. But, you know, we're, we're down to the nuts and the bolts, the boots on the ground kind of kind of service here at Austin Wilkes. So just appreciate your time and your attention and, you know, anything we can do to help our fellow heroes, um, we're, we're here for that. So that's my time. Well, thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. And please... Uh, be sure and put your uh, information in the chat for anyone who is interested and certainly we can uh, help connect uh, as well with Veterans Day coming up next week. Um, you know, it's always important to remember uh, our veterans and to, to know how we can uh, support them in, in multiple ways. And certainly uh, the, they, they have a lot of challenges uh, and 
Um, you know, there's some innovative examples of homelessness, uh, things around homelessness that are going on uh, across the country. And, and uh, I know here in the upstate, some good initiatives, but always uh, something, an issue that needs to continue to be addressed. Steve, uh, Paige Stevenson has put some contact in yes, information in there for you. So please be sure and connect with that. Uh, so with that, uh, Mayor Roberts, I'm going to turn it back over to you if you have uh, a good internet uh, connection now, and we are right on time. And again, uh, we have our in-person celebrating successes in a little bit less than two weeks, and then we'll be back uh, for our last chat of the year, the first week of December. Hey, thanks, Dean. Thanks. Um, always timely information from our, our speakers. I uh, want to thank Scott. Um, he always draws a crowd and look forward to hearing from him uh, next year. And, and again, thanks to, to Michael and Steve for highlighting things like um, food deserts and, and how we can help our um, homeless veterans and, and, and others. So anyway, first part of November, I hope to see you before Thanksgiving. But if I don't, I hope everybody has a good Thanksgiving holidays and we will um, hopefully see you soon. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, everybody.